Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Today's episode is a very special one as well. This episode is part of a series of interviews dedicated to celebrate Dr. Marc Caron, a giant and visionary in the GPCR field and beyond. In this episode, we talked to a panel of 10 guests who worked with Dr. Caron in some shape or form in the 1990s. I also had the honor of working with Dr. Kathleen Caron, the daughter of Mark Caron, who is my co-host in this series of episodes. Before we dive into this episode, we are thrilled to announce that our ecosystem is expanding and are delighted to count Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology as our ecosystem partners in 2023. Become an ecosystem member yourself and join our partners and your colleagues today. The ecosystem is your GPCR-focused virtual playground. Join over 700 of your peers who have already started exploring, connecting, and collaborating better. You can explore the ecosystem by signing up and getting a free site membership. And when you are ready, you can also get a premium membership to unlock the ecosystem's full benefits. If you'd like to register your team or your company, or if you live in a developing country, please reach out to us at hello at drgpcr.com so that we can help you join us. The list of benefits of the ecosystem is quite long. Today, we want to highlight that as a premium member, you can get in touch directly with your peers directly in the ecosystem, discuss GPCRs in the forum, and even ask topic-specific questions in a dedicated group that you can also create yourself within the ecosystem. Are you looking for your next career opportunity? Our job board is a GPCR focused one where you can explore different opportunities. And if you're looking to hire, you can also submit your job description. Wondering what GPCR meetings to attend next? Check out the event page where we have curated the next GPCR meetings for you. In case you're organizing a meeting, you can fill out the event submission form and advertise your meeting directly in the ecosystem. Take advantage of everything that the new dedicated GPCR online playground has to offer today. Explore the possibilities by navigating the site using the direct links in the footer. Check it out today at drgpcr.com ecosystem. And now let's dive into this very special episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR, and I'm excited today to record part two of the Dr. GPCR podcast, our series and tribute to Dr. Marc Caron. Today, we have with us many guests, but first, I'd like to say thank you to Kathleen Caron, who is my co-host for this episode, and welcome everyone here. Kathleen, thank you for being here, and everybody is. Great. Well, thank you so much, Yamina. Um, You know, this means so much to to me and to my family. So, you know, my heartfelt thanks to to you for organizing this, both from my sister, Melissa, and my brother, Nelson, and all the grandchildren as well. Um, We really appreciate this. And a huge thanks to all of you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedules during holiday season um, to come together. Um, And, you know, we really look forward to having a, a great reflection and, and memories um, of Mark. And um, so thank you, Yamina, and, and thank you to all of you um, for doing this. Um, so I think, Yamina, uh, we can kick off. And, yes. and what we'll do to kick off the, the podcast is go around our Zoom call and introduce ourselves. Um, <laughs> And so um, I, I will kick things off as, as an example, and then I'll call the next person that I see on my screen, and we'll just <clears> move forward <throat> like that, and then dive into some more discussions and storytelling. Um, so I am um, Kathleen Carone, and um, I first met uh, Mark on July 17th, 1970, um, <laughs> when I was born. <laughs> And uh, so I'm his eldest daughter and uh, Melissa and Nelson are um, my siblings. And um, so that's how I first met Mark. And I'm currently um, a professor and chair of the cell biology and physiology department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It's a large basic science department and um, I'm a cardiovascular researcher, but um, it, I guess it must be fate. Uh, I also work a little bit in GPCRs, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'll pass this along to the next person that I see on my screen, which is Stefan. 
Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Stéphane Lapop. I'm a professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of uh, McGill, McGill University. Uh, I first met Mark in 1997, I guess, uh, at the Endocrine Society. Uh, he came to my poster um, and asked me what I was doing. I, I, give, I gave all my presentation, of, uh, the, my science and everything. And uh, then he asked me, what are you doing next? So I, I thought he was asking me about my science, but he was asking me, what are you doing next in your career, your plan? So this is how I, I ended up in Mark's, uh, in, in Mark's lab. And, uh, and that's it. Stefan, you get to pick the next person who will introduce Oh, uh, Steve. Thanks, Stefan. <clears throat> I am Steve Ferguson. I'm also a professor at the University of Ottawa and Distinguished Research Chair in Neurodegeneration. Um, I first met Mark or became aware of Mark's research when he came to McGill to give a presentation in the Department of Pharmacology. I wrote him a letter, which he phoned me back the next day after he got the letter to offer me to come down to North Carolina to meet him to discuss the possibilities of postdocs. So my wife and I drove back from our honeymoon in Florida and stopped in in Durham, North Carolina, where I had the chance to get to know Mark a little bit better just about exactly 30 years ago. Thank you, okay. Steve. Who would you like to go next? Oh, let's go with somebody who was there when I was already there. So Neil, you're the next person on my screen. Thank you, Steve. My name's Neil Friedman. I'm a cardiologist at Duke. And I first met Mark in January of 1992, when as a cardiology fellow, I came to work with Mark and Bob Lefkowitz as a postdoctoral fellow. And <clears throat> Mark was always much more friendly to me and generous to me than I deserved. That's what that was my first memory of Mark. And I knew him for 30 years, and that never changed. Thank you, Neil. Who, uh, who would you like to? I guess I get to pick the next person, so that will have to be Martin. Okay, so Martin Beaulieu, I'm professor and research chair in molecular psychiatry at University of Toronto, Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. I met Mark for the first time in while interviewing for a postdoc. So essentially, I discovered him through PubMed. And I was interested to know what this guy was doing. And he gave me an opportunity to give an interview. And uh, that was actually the most sympathetic interview I had for the whole shopping for a postdoc process. It was just amazing. Lend me a car, uh, go explore, have a nice weekend. Um, that was just great. So I decided to come. and. That was in 2000, started in 2001, and met known in since then. So next one, Richard, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> so, goodness, uh, I, I've known Mark forever. It's almost as long as Kathleen, it seems. Um, I knew of him from my, my graduate work because I was working in GPCRs back, back in the day um, and had the opportunity to meet him in 1989. <laughs> <laughs> at a NATO meeting in the Netherlands, uh, which was a meeting of about 30 people. And he spent his time trying to convince me to come to Duke. So I never actually really interviewed for postdoctoral positions. I just kind of announced when I was coming <laughs> and appeared at Duke in 1992, just after Neil. Um, and I stayed there until 2018. So I worked my way up through faculty and had my own lab there for a while. And then um, more recently have moved to Case Western University uh, in Cleveland at the Harrington Discovery Institute. Um, so yeah, I, I I saw Mark kind of every um, every at least every week for twenty six years. Thank you, Richard. Um, What's next? Um, I guess uh, Jay. I I I actually wondering whether I'm the only one who is not a professor here, and I'm actually. A researcher in a pharmaceutical company called Santa Fe, and I'm uh, leading a group of analysts doing um, competitive analysis for the company. And um, so I'm Mark's PhD student, so I think that's also different from everybody else looks like. 
So I first uh, met Mark in 1995. I remember that was my last rotation, and I had done two rotations with uh, in uh, in another two labs. And at the time, I think I worked in two relatively um, small lab, and and I was looking for a lab that's uh, uh, you know a little bigger to have a different experience. And also, I I was always interested in signal transduction. So I was asking around, you know, who is doing signal transduction. And Mark appeared to have a very good reputation. So I decided to uh, go talk to Mark. So I'm actually, is not approached by Mark. I actually go to Mark and ask him um, whether I can be a rotation student in his lab. So I would, I think the first impression, um, automatically I was attracted to him because he's very accessible and very easy to talk to. And also, I think he's so clear in explaining things. You know, at the time I had really language barrier. I think he was the one who I can really understand. So, so I don't know why, but he just was very good at talking and he's very knowledgeable. So I think also the first impression, I don't know, around the table, people probably have that in, in, impression. He's really kind, you know, he's really like, just like to you, like, um, uh, like a, a very friendly, like already a friend when you talk to him, even for the first time. So, so I decided to do a rotation there. And I think of the difference between, uh, you know, by the end of my rotation, I already have a project. So automatically it was very interesting. I decided I'll stay on. And afterwards, you know, I just, uh, I think I never regretted about it. it, it it's a good decision. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Who's next? Who, who do you nominate next? Um, I will go to Stuart. Hi, thank you. I'm Stuart Maudsley. I'm a, the uh, Odysseus Chair of Receptive Pharmacology at the University of Antwerp. And uh, I've known Mark since uh, 1996 when I first interviewed. And then I came the next year to work in Bob's lab. And it was a fascinating uh, contrast, a, a true compare and contrast to see Bob and Mark's lab next to each other. It uh, was the most wonderful concoction, and it produced some of the greatest science. But just the just the the stark differences was uh, remarkable. And I've known Mark for many years from a point of view of a PubMed sort of interaction before, but uh, I was instantly astounded by how Mark was sort of, sort of this quiet yet insightful person who would always ask the right question and hit the nail on the head instantly. And uh, it was. Uh, Remarkable to meet him in real life at that point, but uh, but yeah, it was a tremendous experience. Okie dokie. So uh, I suppose the last person left is Josh. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so my name is Josh Snyder. I'm an associate professor here at Duke University in the Department of Surgery and Cell Biology. Uh, I had known Mark, uh, I formerly met Mark in the spring of 2009. And it was uh, toward the end of my graduate student career that I became uh, interested in this receptor uh, named LGR5. And I was a classically trained stem cell biologist with very little molecular insight or biochemical understanding. And that's when I came and I uh, uh, reached out to Mark to see if, you know, he could teach me the ways of GPCRs. And, uh, uh, you know, I was just astounded that, you know, Mark was not only excited about uh, teaching me this, but also giving me the opportunity to kind of go off onto a potentially different course within the lab. And so it was like that from the start of when I knew him in 2009, uh, where he was willing to just let me kind of go my own way at, at great, I think, expense to his own lab and, and really at expense to just uh, 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 just everything he was already doing. So it was just wonderful to see him mentor me that way. And I know he mentored many others that way as well. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much, everyone, for for going around the the table. So let's let's dive into the discussion, and uh, if we can go around. And Kathleen, perhaps I'll let you start because I think you've had this is episode. Actually, this is, we we kind of went out of our way to accommodate everyone's schedule, and so this is part two. But we've already spoken to uh, the group in part one and part three, and I loved your your answer to this question. I think it's absolutely worth 
um, starting with you, and then you can you can we can kick off the discussion from there. But how do you think Mark influenced the GPCR field? But also, how do you think Mark influenced science or the people around him? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Yamina, for that question. Um, yeah, I you know we've we've heard a lot of different answers. How did did Mark influence the field of GPCRs? And um, and and I'm sure you all will have a lot of uh, in so many ways, right? It, there's there's as many individuals there are as many individual answers. Um, and but I I speak of a perspective a, a little different. Um, just having sort of lived uh, through the different epochs uh, of, of my life and um, watching the, the Carome Lab family, which is huge. Um, and some of you are here today. And so for me, when I look at his greatest accomplishments and, and perhaps it's what he might think as well, it's not, you know, beta arrestin or affinity chromatography or, um, you know, transporters. It's you, it's you, it's the community of people. Um, that is, you know, the, the the biggest influence that he's had because the the influence that he has had in mentoring and training just scores and scores of people that then take that and expand it to the field. Um, I find that to be really the, the greatest gift um, and contribution that he's made to the field of GPCRs. So it's about the people. Thank you, Kathleen. And I think if I if I could add to that, it's just the the response rate when we started this podcast series project uh spoke volumes everyone who was invited we narrowed down and narrowing down the list was very difficult uh responded positively and i think that just speaks speaks absolute volumes when it comes to uh, to the impact on the on the people all right who wants to to add or try and, and add their perspective to this. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to. Um, I actually had exactly the same answer as what Catherine has uh, has said, and uh, and I think uh, it, you know, in addition to all, all those trainee students, I think has all we know. Mark has great work ethics, and she he's always very passionate about his job and his work and his trainees and the students. I absolutely think his passion is is infectious and it's kind of amplifying everybody. Just look at everybody around the table, you know, the scientists, the professors, and and, and even myself. You know, I I still in the scientific field and consider myself to be a scientist. So I think of really his influence really amplifies through uh, uh, through his love for science and his love for teaching and and and, and you know love for all his trainees and students. Yeah. Teaching now, I saw it. So I was at Duke for a long time, and he, he, you know, he always ran the cell signaling course. That was his thing, and he was just about. You know to that I actually, Richard, I actually met my husband. In, Richard, I actually met my husband in the cell signaling course. Um, yeah, and so he wanted he wanted to know if it was legal to ask the professor if he could take the daughter out on a date. So, so yes, the cell signaling course was a great class. It was finally about ready to give it up when I when I left. So I don't know who, who's doing it now, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's how much he enjoyed the teaching. So, but I mean, you know, but scientifically, I mean, you know, it, 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 this is a GPCR podcast, right? So that we think of GPCRs as a family is Mark, because without you know his extraordinary extraordinary effort to show that he could purify a receptor that almost doesn't exist. I mean, fifteen femtomoles per milligram to actually purify enough that they got some sequence. And with the sequence suddenly you unlock, there's a family, they're all the same. And not only that, but then with the GRKs and with the Arrestins, all of that, all of that similarity, all of that you know, modularity that we all bring to the table, that all stems from his work. You know, you know Lefkowitz, Bob Lefkowitz was kind of the idea guy, right? Who's got the, got the grand plans, but Mark was the one actually in the lab doing the work that got it to happen. And so all of that stems from him. Yeah, if you want to go later on, the work that was done, because this is the GPCR podcast, but the contribution is way larger than GPCRs. Uh, there's the work on the transporters. Yeah, fine. There's the work on psychopharmacology. There's a work on, I mean, 
he left a career of publications that is somebody purely in behavioral pharmacology would be proud of. And that's just one example because the, somebody at the next bench was doing uh, embryonic development in zebrafish. And so the broad of the spectrum of trying to link the GPCR with their functions in vivo, the, the signaling in vivo, which very few people did. I mean, signaling was done, but signaling was done for, by kinase people, not by GPCR people that much. And then bringing it back to a phenotype, bringing it back to even human genetic. This was an extremely diverse lab thematically when we were, I mean, when I was there at least. So, and I never saw the like again. So just this effort to bring everything together is just amazing. So I guess when I came to the lab, I was told by my colleagues at McGill that GPCR pharmacology was a dead field. We knew everything yeah. about GPCR. <laughs> it's amazing how wrong people were. And it was people like Mark who actually had a vision for what the potential of GPCRs were. You know, I remember when Bob had his first um, beta arrest knockout mice and he was looking hard, very hard for a phenotype in the heart and one wouldn't come. And I remember sitting in Mark's office and says, I know exactly the experiment I wanted to in the brain. I want to look at pain. And he was right. Mm -hmm. So he, he had a he had broad perspective beyond being an endocrinologist, beyond being a pharmacologist. He had a big sort of picture and was not selfish with sharing his ideas. And I think he shared a lot of great ideas with all of us. I remember when I first got the lab, I wanted to be on the transporter side. He made it very clear I was going to work on receptors. Uh, within two weeks, I gave up and started working on receptors. Yeah, it seems to have worked out okay. I'm working on transporters again now, finally. But, um, uh, you know, he sat in his office and he threw, you know, seven or eight off the cuff. Some were a bit out there ideas. Some of them were bang on. And usually within one one of those ideas in the 78 was a spectacular idea that really changed how we began to think about how receptors function. They don't just sit at the cell surface and signal from the surface, but you know, they move throughout the cell, they interact with a wide variety of different proteins. Mm -hmm. Their expression levels matter greatly. You know, 293 cell is not a neuron, is not a lymphocyte. They're all very much different cellular living organisms within the whole body. And I think that's one of the things he understood before anybody else did. I think that gave him a huge advantage. And he openly shared that with people, but you know, it took a while, but people caught. So, you know, he was very generous with his ideas and with his time. Uh, so so uh, just to catch the ball of uh, what uh, Steve was saying, I think for me, the biggest impact, and I'm gonna talk when I started in a lab in his lab, and Steve was there, uh, Jay was there too, Robert Oakley, and Larry Barrick. And at the time, Larry was uh, had this great idea of uh, tagging the arrestin protein with the green fluorescent protein. Uh, so I think this also changed, uh, really changed the field, in fact, because we realized that, like Steve was saying, the receptor were not only sitting there at the cell surface, but were going inside. And I think a whole field opened after that, knowing that receptors and rest and were co-trafficking and many of you guys and, and uh, you know contributed to this uh, you know Steve in particular showing that the rest is an endocytic uh, adapter uh, and from there I think it really exploded and today we talk about bias and drugs and different effects probably because you know in Mark lab we had the vision of seeing and showing that uh, GPCR is all, not only signaling in the cell surface but they're probably trafficking and, and later on regulating different function. Mm. Yeah, Stefan, you bring me back to something I say in most of my lectures on pharmacology about when Larry first put GFP on the beta adrenergic receptor. Both Mark and I looked at him like he was nuts. What are you doing putting a 28 kill dalton protein off of the other 46 kill dalton protein? There's no way it would signal. And Larry said, I just want to try it, Mark. Went, okay, try it. Well, it signaled better than wild type receptors. So there was no problem putting a fluorescent protein. Roger Shen showed up that year to give a seminar and asked him, is there anything you think you can't put um, GFP on? I said, don't think you can put them on G heterotrimeric G proteins. Well, Michelle Bouvier went on to prove them wrong. 
and, and, and just to follow up on this, I don't know if you remember, but when you and Jay started to work with Bed Rest and GFP and looking at translocation of the cell surface, we knew it was involved in desensitization, but later on we found out that there was co-trafficking cool inside. And again, it was because of Larry's idea of putting a GFP uh, on the arrestment, and we knew that it was going inside. And the whole field totally opened at that. And, and the first experiment failed miserably because we overexpressed beta resin way too high. We put 10 micrograms of cDNA. We needed to get down to 0.1 micrograms so that it became a tracer. And all of a sudden, you had Jay, myself, Larry, and Mark in the room with the confocal jumping up and down, excited about you know seeing this protein move inside the cell for what we knew of it, the first time for us ever seeing something dynamically move. So, you know, simple things became very excited, exciting, and, and Mark had a way of sort of making the event even that much bigger. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I really share that excitement because I think um, uh, what I, I said, like Mark is always very enthusiastic. Every time you do something like little or small and he just feels, he just looks so excited, you know, kind of encourage you to keep doing that. And I think he's really a catalyst on, on, on a lot of those things. And he's so open-minded. You know, I think uh, I remember in, in, when I was doing, uh, in graduate school, I would just went to uh, through some lectures and uh, I read a paper and I talked to Mark about, say, dynaming. And he just all in a sudden, you know, very excited. Say, oh, you know, we can get some construct. Let's do this. Let's do that. All in a, in a sudden, it become a, a story, uh, you, you know, by itself. So I think that the other thing I want to add from Probably a different aspect is that when I started, um, I think Mark's influence is not just in the academic, and because you know uh, many of you are professors, so I'm in the industry. And, and why, when I first stepped into the industry, and I was uh, looking around, uh, of course, interviewing with different companies, and none, everybody knows Mark. I was really impressed every time after I did my seminar put on my technology, you know, slide, everybody light up uh, and they all know Mark. And, and and I think it's, you know, that says not only his impact in, in the science, but, you know, in the industry, a lot of people use his technology, his science, and, and many people has read his papers. So, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I was so proud to be his student, I, I, honestly, when I was interviewing with other people, yeah. Just back to sort of cater to, I'm sorry, Josh, go ahead. No, you're good. You're good. They all come in after. In this case, age before beauty, I suppose. <laughs> I was going to say about a decade or two before the events that were just trans, uh, just described, uh, as I was coming to the lab and as I was attempting to configure a career development award, Mark came to my rescue with another area where he really proved his dominance of the field, which was to say in defining the function of the G-protein coupled receptor kinases, or GRKs in those days, of course, we called them BARC. But in any case, uh, it was Bruno in Mark's lab who was working on creating the first GRK knockout mouse. And I was going to use mouse embryo fibroblasts from those mice in part of my career development award. And had I not been able to do that, I'm quite sure I would not have gotten that award funded. And of course, Mark had nothing to gain by saying, by writing a letter of support and saying he would be happy to share that with me. And yet there he was as generous and as, as sharing as you can imagine a person could ever be. And this I think is a story that reflects sentiments that Kathleen began with, which is to say that to Mark, it is the people who mattered most. I think that's because he realized that it was through his mentoring of people that he could get his ideas enacted. And it was that process that enabled him to answer, to ask and to answer the most important questions. And boy, did he ever do that. Yeah, I think, uh, Neil, you hit on something there with the, the ideas becoming into action with, with the people he's mentoring. And I think, you know, he used to always say, and I'm sure we've all heard it a million times, ideas are cheap and work is expensive, right? And so, you know, he really had that commitment to, you know, actually fleshing it out and getting it to work. And, you know, it's a, it's a long-term process. And I think 
it's particularly, I think what, what drew me to his lab was his ability to, I think we already mentioned, he had zebrafish development biology, he had HEK cells going on, and he eventually it all got back into a systems biology view in vivo. And so I think someone mentioned earlier that he really got it ahead of everybody else that, you know, if we're going to study a receptor, yes, we need to know the biochemistry about it. We need to know the conformations. We need to know the selective signaling. But in the end, we need to know how that's actually working in a defined cell type of interest in a system. And it was just remarkable, his long uh, term uh, foresight into all of this, right? And being able to plan a program around that and, and take those calculated yet high level risks to get there. And it was just always a very exciting place to be because of that. Uh, and it's just, uh, it just was always amazing to see these molecular pathways work out in vivo. And I think that was, you know, perhaps what continues to be inspiring to me uh, as, you know, I mentor students and, and others in the lab is to, to help them get to that point where they see the, the long term goal of these projects and piecing it all together ultimately in vivo. Yeah, I mean, just to sort of uh, chime in on that, I mean, this was over 20 years ago, and I was happily doing, you know, Westerns on active map kinases and stuff, and down the same corridor, just a few doors away, there was Raoul doing tail suspensions, you know, with, with his mice during the night, and thinking, wow, they're doing like, you know, the, yeah. there's the work that Stefan and Steve and Larry and Bob were doing with the Burrest and GFP, and then there's a guy next door with tail suspensions, and it's like, dude, this is way ahead of the time i mean this is the thing that we've sort of all realized now <clears throat> i mean we love the term systems biology blah 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 you don't understand how to uh analyze your molecular data without the simultaneous demonstration of the in vivo pharmacology and this was over 20 years ago now it's a, a big thing for most labs this was over 20 years ago yeah and this is the thing that isn't really appreciated because nobody else does it and they really haven't done it since, really. And we're now beginning to understand the importance of having this simultaneous multi-dimensionality view. We understand multi-omics, blah, blah, blah. But putting it in an in vivo preclinical context or even a clinical context is even now light years ahead. And this was 20 years ago. So... I think that's a tremendous legacy. And this was done by, I mean, the thing that we've all understood here, the excellence in recruiting and mentoring and shaping. You can't do that unless you can deal with all the differences and contingencies of different scientists doing those different jobs and understanding it at a multidimensional level. It's very, very rare to have that in a scientist. It really is. Yeah, that's moving us to the next question, actually. Because in the major qualities, the thing is, it would have been impossible for a micromanager to do that. He was trusting, he was letting people, I mean, one of the things he told me when I asked him for a project, he said, oh, I will give you a project, but do whatever you want as long as I'm, in, I'm interested. Mm. Okay, <laughs> fine. And that led to early adoption of technologies, not necessarily, I mean, they didn't invent a tagging thing with GFP, but they were among the first to do it. They didn't invent it making knockout mice, but I think some of the knockouts that were done there were among the first in the nervous system. And so you have to be able to jump, to live that level of freedom and then go in the complete unknown and then catch up. Because sometimes we were coming to Mark and he was absolutely lost. And three months after, he was having pertinent question. He did catch up. He did his reading. He did. It's not like, oh, yeah, you guys are going to carry me. No, he was actually coming back and challenging us on something that three months before he, I mean, the first time I came to him with GSK3, he was like, what? Yeah, it's something with insulin, isn't it? And it was all mixed up in what the signal was doing and how it was working. And uh, months, few months after, it was perfectly integrated and like you've been working on that all his life. So that's this level of flexibility. And at the same time, the level of, I mean, I used to joke that Bob's lab was the Marines and we were the Navy SEALs. That 
there was like a lot more variability in what we were doing and a lot more, a uh, lot less, you know, you work on receptor A, the guy at the next bench work on receptor B, or the guy at this bench work on knocking everything with SHRNA and this guy will do a knockout. No, it was like free for all, let's have fun. And that gave exactly what you're talking about, this integration of having somebody doing tail suspension and microdialysis and somebody else doing uh, spending hours on a confocal following arrested. But the mindset, the level of trust in oneself and others to do that is amazing. Thank Martin, you. I think Good. what you're discussing too relates to another quality of Mars, which is a certain level of fearlessness, which is to say, oh, yeah. <laughs> if something was hard, Mark would say, let's do it. Uh, he exemplified that in his own behavior in years well before you knew him, for example, when things needed to be radio iodinated. He didn't ask a postdoctoral fellow to do it. He probably, to be honest, he didn't want to burden anybody with that. So he would do it himself. And he used to joke that he had a little hunchback. He was a little bit like Cosimoto from all the radiation that he absorbed over the decades, but he would always choose the hard things and he would choose them because he thought they were important and he would choose them because he thought they would yield worthwhile data, worthwhile answers to important questions. So Neil, just to interject on that, Mark loved ionating peptides. That was one of his favorite, favorite things. You should have seen the smile on his face. Those were the best days of any week of the year, the days when he was doing ionizations. It was something he just loved. Yes, and I sometimes had to follow him in the hot lab after he did that. Oh, yeah, it would be a disaster, sure. <laughs> no, no, I was going to say to the contrary, he he always cleaned up. You know, it, it was always safe to work in that room after he finished that. I could not say the same of many other investigators, but Mark, it was safe. Yeah, he was a little bit disappointed when and Stefan showed up with his set pack columns that were so easy to use. <laughs> He'd like the thin layer chromatography the old fashioned way. But anyway, just shows you how technologies move along over time. But, uh... Thanks everyone for that. If you want to jump in and, um, you know, just put in a couple of words, three, four words that describe Mark when it comes to his qualities. But before you do that, I just wanted to mention that the way you were talking about, you know, the variety and the breadth and the depth also of the research that was done in the lab or that is done in the lab, it sounded like a very well integrated pipeline, which, you know, is still, when I think about labs in general and having that breadth is still something that's not um, not everyone has that in their lab and thinking about the fact that this existed in 20 years ago and was the case, I think it's just really important to call it out that there was this whole, um, you know, pipeline built out, but it was built out based on the fact that Mark recruited the right people, got the right people excited and let them still explore and use their, their capabilities, their scientific interests to to go on 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 to these different projects, uh, Stefan, you had put a couple of words in the chat. I'll let you uh, perhaps comment on that. Well, to chime on the, uh, Neil's uh, comments, I, I think he was, he was very careful. In fact, but what struck me also as one of his quality was he was extremely generous, not only in science but as but as a person also. I think Martin alluded to that also, that when he came there, we took care of him, like the mm -hmm. car and everything. But but even though after, when we left his lab, I remember that Mark was traveling a lot and he came here in Quebec uh, often to see his family. And uh, he was never shy of asking asking us how we did, right? And uh, when he had a chance, he stopped at our, at our house, asked how things were. He was genuinely caring about people. And, and not only during the time in the lab, but what we became after, uh, making sure that things were going right. Uh, but not only talking about science, talking about things, others, uh, or, or, or other uh, topics. So I really did appreciate this. One. And, and I, I think really to be successful in science, and we all share this to a different degree, but Mark was a passion, was really passionate about science. 
And, and he keeps saying also, I remember this, you know, if it's a good idea and you're not able to do it now, come back later to it. We'll, we'll have the tools to do that. Mm. So, so make sure that if it's a good idea, it, it will eventually pan out. And, and you should come back to it and try to address this. So, so I, I think those are some of the lessons I, I learned from, from, you know, interacting with him. And, uh, and, and the biggest quality, I think, it was uh, is his generosity. And this, this really uh, stand out for me. Yeah, I totally agree with Stefan. I think Mark is really a genuine, kind person, you know, from the heart. And I think one of the story I want to share is that um, I, I think when I was doing my uh, my uh, my PhD, and I think it's early, and I was st still taking classes, and I was doing presentation. I'm obviously was not very good at presentation. I remember, I think um, every time I, Mark tell me, like every time I have presentation, I should tell him. And I actually told him a few times, every time I told him he showed up at my at my class, actually sitting at the back. I think Catherine was sharing some of those uh, presentations at times, but even, you know, not all of them. So actually, I think at the time I have not seen other professor, if I, 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 if I remember wrong, I don't know. But I have never seen other professors show up at the back and sitting, listen to their uh, student presenting. And so I think I actually made an effort. I, I think I spent probably 10 times more time than other students to prepare my presentation because I know Mark is going to show up. And he not only show up, he uh, he will make comments. He will tell me, you know, what I did a, a good. Usually, he 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 have very positive attitude. So so I think that really uh, speak to that. You know, he he is quite famous already at that time. He runs probably a, one of the largest lab in the department. Uh, yet, you know, he comes to uh, all my presentation. That was really moving. I have to say, yeah, so I remember Jay, that for it. It's so funny that you say that. So for people who don't know, Jay and I I were graduate students together, contemporaries in the same PhD program. And Jay, I remember that you and I were on the schedule together often. And, and for me, it was always so stressful that I was going to speak at the same time as you because it meant my father would be sitting in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also I think I really, really spend a lot of time. People like, say, oh, you have to presentation tomorrow, and I, I just did my presentation. I said, well, I started a month ago, you know. <laughs> so I really want you to do well because he's sitting there. It's really, you yeah. know, precious. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was precious for me, and I love that you and I were always speaking together. It was really a lot of fun and really wonderful memories that I had. Yeah. Had but then he would also ask me. You know, I worked in a completely different field. You know, in, in uh, stereogenesis and early embryonic de development, and you know, he would call me at home and, you know, would have the right idea and would ask the questions, even, you know, in a, in a totally different field. Have you ever thought of doing this? And no, oh, maybe you should do that. And uh, so this, you know, contagious uh, love of science and, and just a really passionate work ethic um, is something that, that the three of us, uh, the three children um, have, have, you know, learned from him. Um, but I think it certainly translated to a lot of his mentees, too. So, yeah. yeah, I think uh, even if you know, he has so many wonderful postdocs in his lab, I never feel like when he talked to uh, he talked to me, he, he it it was like I just one of them. He never really judged me. You're a student; you might not know as much as the postdocs. And when I talk to him, I just feel like you know I'm part of the lab and the and and I'm part of the group. So so I was really uh, happy with that as well. Yeah, I can remember from talking to. Mark and also a lot of the postdocs at the time that I was there as well was just to sort of uh, coincide with uh, what Stefan was saying about sort of generosity. I can remember a lot of the time there, a lot of the postdocs were being paid in Canadian dollars. And uh, Mark was very, he almost knew the exchange rate every single day. And he was constantly striving and trying to make sure that people didn't feel shortchanged or anything like that. And to <laughs> suffer, yeah, it was, it was quite an odd situation for me saying, what, so you're working in the States and you're being paid in Canada? And they're like, dude, how does that work? But Mark was always, 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 I mean, not only doing the science, but also managing everyone's personal lives as well and their financial lives. I mean, just remarkable. I mean, just really exceptional how much care he took, even with postdocs that were just like super green and super fresh in the lab, he would take the time. There wasn't like a hierarchy of like, these are the, the grand postdocs and these are the junior postdocs. It was 
a real meritocracy, and it was uh, really re- remarkable. You, uh, you, generosity has been mentioned a couple of times, and I think one of my favorite stories, and you know, I think uh, Neil kind of alluded to it as well, since he's at Duke, and, you know, he did his postdoctoral training at Duke and then stayed as faculty, and I, I'm the same, of course, uh, was that, you know, I just got my startup going, my lab started, and I thought I was, you know, flush with cash, as we all are when we're young. And started realizing, how am I going to pay for all this stuff? And uh, I needed a cell culture incubator. And I was, you know, back on one of my trips, many weekly or or at least monthly trips to say hello to Mark and see what was up. And he's like, well, I got an incubator right over here you can have. I'm like, really? And he went and got a dolly. And he loaded the incubator on the dolly. And then he and I, you know, moved this incubator from his lab to my new lab and installed it in the way he went. Right. And so this was the, you know kind of guy he was right he would give you anything he would you know i'm sure it would have been the same for all of you if your lab was down the hall he would have been uh you know uh um sneaking you pipette tips or whatever it would be to get you going right and uh he really you know was generous just like that over and over again that's just one one of many stories thank you john i would characterize mark with the adjectives besides the ones that we've already used i would like to introduce some new ones since he was so multi-dimensional wise humble and fun loving his breadth of knowledge was staggering and i think this came out and he would never of course brag about this rather he would wield his intellect only for the purpose of helping someone else or to get something done, which inevitably involved helping someone else. Uh, At Data Club, if you ever wanted to know who wrote something, who it was, who did it, Mark would be the one to tell you, and he would tell you the publication. But he did it in such a way that he made fun of himself in the context of doing this. For example, why didn't I do that first? Another beautiful example of Mark's ability to bring science to bear on physiologically important things was illustrated in a very unusual venue. It was Medicine Grand Rounds. I've been going to Medicine Grand Rounds for 32 years at Duke. And the best medical Grand Rounds was given by Mark Carone, who's not a physician, obviously. He was talking about TPH1 and a knockout in the brain versus a knockout in the periphery and tried to explain why it was that uh, you took certain approaches. The discussion was about depression, I think. And uh, it was brilliant. And everybody in the room understood it. And I think everyone was really impressed with the way that Mark made the whole thing accessible to a bunch of people who didn't know anything about molecular biology or tissue-specific knockouts. Mark made it just easy. It was just brilliant. Uh, Lastly, his fun-loving nature. Remember that one of the reasons that we all loved Mark was that he always made us feel good. Even when things were, anybody can feel good when things are going right. Mark found a way to make people feel good when things were going wrong. Anyone else wants to chime in? I have. Two short follow-up questions, but before we do so, please feel free to chime in if you'd like. I'd say, uh, I mean, one, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is persistence, right? So he took on really hard projects that didn't have solutions. You know, can you purify the receptor? Can, you know, and created techniques where he needed to, and you know, wasn't afraid to try new things to get things to work. But he was always, you know, pushing people to do things that were very hard to do, and, and I think that really showed. But the other thing is, you know, people kind of look at his lab and say, well there are all these things going on and they don't, they, they seem very disparate. And, and to me, it's not, that's not true. He had a very holistic view of what he was doing, I think, where, you know, a lot of people look at, you know, the, the, the thinking about a GPCR was they're like a light switch. They're on, they're off. And he always thought in dynamics. So how are, how are things regulated? So if you're thinking how the receptor is regulated, well, you work out of dopamine receptors, they're regulated by the transporter. So it's natural you work on the transporters. Uh, this is what it looks like if this receptor is in 293 cells. But what is it really? What really happens in vivo? You know. So uh, as an example, right, I'm, I was one of the ones making all the knockouts in in the Leftwitz lab. P.S. In the Leftwitz lab, no one ever characterized the knockout. 
all of the characterization for all the knockouts were done in Mark's lab because he's the one that had a holistic view that, that Martin mentioned earlier. What is it that the receptor really does in its right location? How is that different from what we see in a cell? And so that holistic view of how nature works really drove his science. So that, that I think was a really defining characteristic. Yeah, I think I want to add to um that, that I think uh, for me, uh, some, sometimes the word jump uh, to me is like Mark is a catalyst. He really, uh, you know, has the personality. He's so kind. He can unite a group and put the right people together to working uh, together. Like, you know, Steve, Stefan already mentioned, I, I enjoy tremendously uh, working with Steve, Stefan and Larry and and and. And also Mark is highly knowledgeable. I think uh, some of us may remember Mark is always on the road and he's attending conferences. He's either listening to other talk or he's talking himself. So he's highly, high, highly not knowledgeable and he's always making sense of everything. You know, he would bring back the knowledge. And even if like I was new in the field, I would be able to understand, uh, you know, what he's talking about and you know, what, what he has learned from a certain conference because he's trying to, you know, make sense of what we're doing, connecting the thoughts to, to what others are doing. So just make all those knowledge so accessible. You know, he really catalyzed this uh, group of brilliant scientists and trainees and students you know, to to do wonderful work. And I, I think he, he's truly remarkable, you know, like an enzyme. Thank you, Jay. Jay, you mentioned the, um, the traveling a lot. Um, so as as a family member and as his daughter, we certainly knew that, you know, and, and our family, we joked that we, you know, we should call the lab to see if dad's in town or not, because, you know, on any given day, you didn't know if he was on an airplane or if he was coming home for dinner. <laughs> he was just, a, you know, a, a real frequent flyer. Um, but he loved it. You know, he he was a world traveler and he loved his travels. He loved meeting with people. Um, you know, many of us go to conferences and we come back and we're exhausted. And and I saw that opposite in my father, right? He would come back just energized and so excited, you know, oh, I met with this person and this is, you know. And uh, so I think, you know, world traveler and just enjoying travels and sort of being fearless to go out and, and get that information and bring it back to the lab is something that, that he loved. He just loved doing. So. Yeah, our lab meeting were on Tuesday. And I remember one Tuesday, he walked in that meeting at 9.30 a.m. straight out of RDU. He was coming back from Germany. So, yeah, I, I could imagine the other side. <laughs> Thank you. The other thing that Mark had was a great deal of patience um, for other people and for projects. Um, it's taken me 30 years to develop anything quite close to what he has in the way of patience with my students and postdocs. Um, I think I'm slowly getting there um, by retirement, maybe. Um, but, uh, you know, he would take the time to be part of people's lives. Um, he saw me coming back from my wife's miscarriage and left lab meeting to take special care of me. And I said, it's a memory that will be with me forever. Mark was always there when, he, when you needed him. Um, and, you know, when you're a long ways away from home, many people were coming, you know, from Europe and Asia, et cetera. He really sort of extended his own family and himself to everybody in the lab to make it that much easier for people to succeed so they could have some time with their families and, and also get the work done. Everybody likes to make fun of him saying, you know, you know, on Friday, you know, have a nice weekend, see you tomorrow. That had nothing to do with him expecting you to be in the lab the next day. It was just his plain excitement with the whole process of science and his humble approach to it. And he, he once complained to me that his being humble is probably one of his biggest failures and that he didn't spend enough time selling himself. And personally, I think that was his strength, that he wasn't out there telling everybody how good he was because we as a group, and you can see it through these three podcasts, recognize the quality and the breadth of his knowledge and uh, his decency as a man and you know, prowess as a scientist. Thank you, Steve. And now, before we move on to the next question, we have one other guest who just joined us, Jacob, without wanting to put you on the spot. Just want to thank you for coming today. Uh, why don't you start uh, briefly introduce yourself and tell us when and how long have you when you met Mark for the first time and how long have you known him, 
and then we can resume our discussion because you arrived really at the at the right time to to jump in with with your perspective. Yeah, thank you, Yamina. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm Jacob Jacobson. I joined the Corona Lab in 2008. And I have sort of a different uh, background than many other people since I've been a lot in biotech and pharma before I came to Mark's lab to try to get a more sort of solid scientific training. And I was in Mark's lab for, um, I think, for 11 years. And most of that time was a long time. We were working on, on getting a drug products project started that was essentially based on trying to quote unquote, dropify the natural precursor of serotonin so that it become a practical approach to treat depression responding inadequately to first-line antidepressants, which are the taxes and the Prozac of the world. And to make a long story short, so we had these ideas and um, we did a lot of animal experiments that uh, sort of pointed to that if you give 5-HTP in a more sustained form, you could get better pharmacological effects and you could also get much better safety. And we also found out a sort of novel way to enhance the bioavailability of 5-HTP. And all that led to some patent applications, eventually patents, and a spin-out company that over many, 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 many years, uh, where Margaret and I just kept at it, we managed to eventually get some funding and uh, Today we are in the fortunate situation that we have raised in the company uh, $23 million and are now phase two ready with two broad products, candidates. And uh, the name of the company is Evexia. And that actually comes, that was invented by Mark. So he sent me an email from late Saturday night and he had been like, looking for Greek words for names for the company. And then you have stumbled over a, 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 the Greek word evexia. That means good psychological and physical health. And he thought it would be a great word for a com great name for a company that was dealing in antidepressants. So that's um, the story behind, um, behind the company. And Mark was extremely supportive over all these years where like it was just 1% progress a year and kept on at it and we kept at it and he supported the project and supplied for um, applied a ton of grants and got a little bit here and there and finally found some investors and Mark uh, played a very big role in getting those early investors by his contacts and you know using his vast network to sort of also get some psychiatrists interested and sort of building an interest base around the idea and he was involved almost to the very to the very last and uh, without Mark there wouldn't have been any Vexia. Now what we are hoping for that we have two drug products the one is called EVX 101 and that would be sort of an adjunctive treatment for depression responding inadequately to SSIs, SNIs or Prozac and Balls of the world and uh, if that works out, we would be able to introduce a new treatment for depression that would uh, address the largest segment unmet need in depression and in a, in a safer way than current approaches. And another drug candidate we have that's also based on 5 hgp that's an injectable for suicidality, for acute, suicidal, for acute suicidal crisis which is probably the biggest mental health problem in the US today, with over a million hospitalizations. And there's no FDA approved treatment for suicidal ideation. So um, we're working very hard to, um, to, to also let Mark's legacy live on that way. And hopefully within three, four, five years, some uh, drugs will get approved on the market that uh, essentially started in Mark's lab. Thank you, Jacob. And I think that's really in the rounds up this, this segment because one of the questions in segment two was how did Mark influence the GPCR field and science in, in general? Um, and we were just talking about the three, if you had 
three to five words that you could uh, that could you could use to describe Mark's qualities that made him successful. I think you, um, Jacob. I think you you kind of went and explained some some of the work that you've been doing and the consequences of that generosity, of that resourcefulness, of that ability to to think broadly. What else would you would you think, Jacob? You could add when it comes to top qualities that Mark made Mark successful. Well, sort of like a very wide perspective on things and an open-mindedness for new ideas. And then I think also something that I learned from Mark was uh, his ability to have this enormous network of people that liked and respected him, which I think has been, I assume has been very, I could see that has been instrumental in Mark's career and also what was instrumental to uh, sort of be leveraged in the project I was working on. Thank you. And I think it, what you just mentioned very much reflects what everyone has been saying uh, around uh, when we were talking about this question. Before we move on to the last segment, I have two short questions for, for all of you. One, Ji uh, Yuho, we're talking about, you know, being positivity and support, being supportive. I wanna ask you all, how did you in the lab celebrate successes? Or failures, or made failures feel less painful? Okay. <laughs> well, one thing we had lobster party, a lot of lobster parties. <laughs> I still remember in the in the years when I was a graduate student. You know, lobsters are very precious, and I think every year, Mark and the Pauling and the family would invite us all to um to to the house, and uh, we all will enjoy lobster. And 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 I can never uh, forget about all those experiences years after years. Um, yeah, we celebrate. I think it 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 is like a a fun event, and I also think it's a celebratory event for for everybody, for a year of hard work. Amazing. There was a great. There was a great. Uh, I shouldn't say great, but there was a restaurant uh, on Duke's campus. Uh, uh, Jacob knows who I'm going to say here, uh, and uh, you know, Mark, Mark, if you remember, uh, did his PhD work in Miami. And uh, became became a connoisseur of uh, Cuban sandwiches, and there was this, believe it or not, there was this little restaurant on Duke's campus that used to make Cuban sandwiches on Fridays only. And if there was something to celebrate, uh, Mark would you know gather up the lab, send everybody through the lab, send everyone through the line, and uh, buy everyone Cuban sandwiches. And uh, that was always just a fun. <laughs> you know, 12 o'clock lunch on Mark, and he would talk about how the bread wasn't quite as good as it was in Miami, or it wasn't just quite right, but it was still, uh, uh, it was always a, a fun time. So, so maybe to uh, to add the different dimension here, I, I don't recall Mark celebrating papers. I, I think us were very, very excited when our paper were accepted, and, you know, we're always trying to get into the best journal, and uh, we kind of celebrated amongst us, but but Mark celebrated only when when we had good results. Uh, I remember him being excited, not about a paper being accepted. For him, you know, he knew this next story. Let's move on. But but I th but I think he was really excited when we had an idea, went in the lab, did the experiment, and then he came on Saturday or Sundays, and when sh we showed him a blot or something, and it did work. There, I saw him that was really excited, and we kind of celebrated. And his way of celebrating was, was telling us, I told you it would work, right? So, and if it didn't work anyway, it was probably your idea, right? So if it works, it, it comes from me. So he was being facetious about this, but, but I think it was his way of celebrating the science and, and not so much celebrating the achievement of the publication, because for him, it was just normal. We're doing our business in science, and then and it's going to be published somewhere. Yeah, I think that's quite true, Stefan. When um, Bruno sent him by fax the first data on the dopamine transporter knockout mice, showing that they had a hyper-locomotor hyper phenotype, Mark had that fax folded in his, in his wallet for, I think, nearly 10 years. That's how excited he could be about a single piece of data. Now, it was a pretty important piece of data, but uh, you know, the excitement that he showed over a single piece of data as opposed to a paper 
So I think what sets them apart from a lot of scientists. A, a picture of those mice was on our family home's refrigerator for years, you know, and, and my mother always thought it was so un, unsanitary, you know, to have a picture of the mice on the refrigerator. <laughs> It was like the first, the, the first microbiologist we had a beta resistance in changing distribution of the cell. Like I was up on the, in the, the cabinetry in his office. You know, there's just little pieces of different parts of the history of the lab that he used to be kept alive forever, which I think was really nice. Yeah, actually, regarding paper, he was not that excited. I think if you had a great paper, he was happy, but for the content, not for where it was. And if it was out in a big place, I mean, I think the message we were getting was more attuned to familiar with the Roman triumph. They always had a slave telling the guy, you know, you will die one day. <laughs> don't freak out with it. Just enjoy, but don't freak out with it. And Mark was pretty much the same. Bringing back to her, they said, okay, what are, we do what are you doing next? And what are we discovering next week? So that was more that than calling the journalist and so on. And yeah, and maybe that's feeding with something Steve said, the humidity uh, led to maybe an absence of, I mean, today everybody is, oh, I had an idea this morning. I will put, uh, I will tweet about it. I don't see Mark tweeting, honestly. So. That's that was bringing things back and okay, let's do next. And um, that was probably healthy. Thank you for that. Um, before we move on again, uh, my second question was: um, Is there something that you learned during your time in Mark's lab, whether it's scientific or on a more personal level, that that stuck with you and that you took away from your time in the lab? Take chances. Don't hesitate, don't convince yourself looking at the literature that it's not going to work. Just try it. Anyone else? Treat people well. <laughs> Treat your people well. Pay attention to them, care about them. Yeah, definitely. It's much harder if, if you feel like, you know, if you, you, can, you can motivate them, they'll do things that they wouldn't do otherwise. And also, I think hardworking. I think Mark is extremely hardworking with all, all, all those things people talk about. It's all work, right? I think that's what he did. And I think when he says, I, you know, have a nice weekend, see you tomorrow, it's not joking. You see him tomorrow. And, and I, I, you know, I saw many, many, many Sundays and Saturdays he's sitting there. And, uh, and he even took care of my daughter when I was there, you know, doing a lab work and the, I had no daycare and then he would be there taking care of my kid and when you know when I was doing my lab work. It, yeah, he he's truly I think one of the most hardworking professionals I have seen him. But I guess you yeah. know I don't want to leave don't want to leave with the impression that all he ever did was work. Now, that's, that's that's you know that's Kathleen's domain, but you know I think he had a very good work work life balance. You know, he, he worked very hard, but he also took care of his family and he ran a farm. You know, he did, he did things that were outside of science that made him humble. I mean, he kept him humble, you know, kept him connected to things other than the, you know, the glitz and glamour of science. I think one of the most important things he taught me was to recognize the invisible people. People aren't necessarily in your lab. The ladies who are washing the dishes, the people who are cleaning the floors. Um, you know, that lesson came back to benefit me 15 years right later in a way I would never have imagined. But, uh, you know, he, he realized that there was more than just the students and the postdocs and himself. There was all the support staff in the building that were helping to keep things running. And those people do an incredible job day in and day out. And uh, I noticed and, that many and part people... of that, yeah, I think you're right, Steve. And I think part of that comes from his very humble beginnings. You know, it's... Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's sometimes hard to just really take it all in and realize, you know, where he came from in a very rural little town in, in northern Quebec um, and, you know, a one-room schoolhouse, yeah. right? 
really, literally. Um, I think of all the things he taught me, that's probably the most important because that's one of the biggest shortcomings I've seen in my colleagues over 25 years of being an independent investigator is um, people don't necessarily treat those who might seem invisible the way they should be treated because they, they quietly get a lot done. Okay, well, I think we can move on to another segment now. And because um, we've heard a lot about, you know, um, qualities and, and um, lessons learned and things. And I, I think, you know, it, it's clear that Mark had a, a, an impression on you and how you run your labs and how you work in your teams and, and with your folks. So maybe we can talk a little bit about um, what lessons that you would take from your training and your working with Mark and um, what are the things that junior scientists today, you know, the, the young millennials and the young people training in the labs, what are, what are some of those lessons or things that they should know about Mark? If you had to say, well, you know, here's what my thesis advisor did, or here's what my postdoc advisor um, taught me. What, what are some lessons that junior scientists could learn and, and benefit? I think perhaps one of the things that we've touched upon quite a few times, and uh, one of the things which is persistent in a lot of academia, especially here in Europe, which is very conservative with a small c, is that uh, we have a uh, process that is almost linear. That, as we've discussed before, Mark was doing things in parallel many, many, many years ago, not just pushing on one little narrow furrow essentially and just plowing it and plowing it and plowing it and keeping going but working on many simultaneous tracks that might seem at any one point in time rather nebulous and rather unconnected but eventually once you push hard enough on all those parallel tracks you realize that there's always crossover between them and too often, too many scientists plunge into specialization. We have a phrase here in Belgium being called a subject idiot. You're an idiot on everything apart from your, just your one subject. And that's a real issue because a lot of the old-fashioned professors still profess that as a career track, is that just stay in this one track, have your molecule, and just plow ahead. Mark was light years ahead, 20 years ago, as we say. And we're still light years ahead now. So this idea of not forcing yourself down one assay, one protein, one concept, always keeping yourself open, it's very difficult. It's hard to write a grant like that. If you say that, then they're going to say, no, 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 you can't do this. This is crazy. But that's how science should be done. And it's very difficult to uh, encapsulate that and still make it effective. But as we've seen, and as we've seen with Mars Korea, and just talking about the translational developments that have come from it, that is the way forward. It's not just being a subject idiot. And that's uh, a thing that uh, the future uh, professors have to take into account, this concept of parallelism, of running seemingly disparate programs, or being involved in them at least and understanding them, and taking that forward. You never know when you're going to jump track from those seemingly distinct uh, avenues of research. For the grant proposal, it's a great way to avoid overlaps, though. <laughs> but seriously, it is uh, something that still today is very hard to sell. And some of us here have nominated Mark for awards and have encountered this issue explaining an award committee what this is all about. Give me the one thing we should give this guy an award for. Uh, and unfortunately, that, again, uh, was a hard sell. Maybe because it was ahead of its time. It was a very hard sell, despite him being very worthy of getting the award. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I've come to grips with the idea that Mark was more than just an award. Um, Mark's more the concept himself. And so I think his contribution is more meaningful than 
whether he got a Nobel Prize, the Alaska Prize, or his Gardner, White, Gardner Award. I don't think those things are really tangible things that mean anything. I think it's the memories that he left behind and the, the hearts and brains of those who he trained. For junior scientists, I think one of Mark's most important lessons, aside from having fun with what you do, was to learn from failure. The failure for Mark was an opportunity. It was not the end of a road. And for junior scientists in particular, I think it is encouraging to believe that failure is a relative concept, that we can learn from failure and really not fail, or viewed from another perspective, that failure is part of success. With no failure, we would not learn where to look next and we would not succeed. To me, that would be a distillation of Mark's attitude towards science that would be most helpful for young scientists. Well, I would I would add so there, there there's this idea in science and you know students who are are, are coming up they want to be in a big lab because that provides the kind of networking that we're doing right now right you have a you know, a, a large cohort of people that can help you in your career but it's not worth it working in a big lab. That's an unhappy lab. It's not worth working in a lab that's miserable, that has a terrible mentor. There are good mentors out there. You just have to find them. Yeah, I think um, I think Mark is uh, open-minded, not just to science, and as you can see around the table, he's also very open-minded to uh, to people. So I think for junior scientists, I think that's a, you know probably a good trait because he's very open-minded to different experience and different level and people bring different ideas even like you can see you know a, a lot of stuff from different country and different ethnic background and so so he's really truly open-minded to everything so so i think um you know he built a huge network of um a variety of uh, of different experience and different um trainees and students i think yeah that's that's a lot yeah. and one one thing i don't i don't know and no one has mentioned which is kind of kind of funny you know um he ran an international lab way before it was Vogue. Okay, so as Kathleen said, he's from Quebec. He's a he's a francophone. He speaks French. When I arrived, when Neil was there, he had two two lab rooms. One was right next to Bob's lab, and another one was off in another building. One room was the French room. Everyone in there spoke French. So if you wanted to get some reagents there, you had to brush up on that high school French <laughs> to, to to know who you know to get get things done. So there was people like you know, Bruno Giros and Mohamed Jaber and you know, a bunch of people. Um, but he's always very welcoming for people coming from other countries, including things like letting them stay at his house. You know, I, I moved from New York City and I, I made the mistake of moving to Durham in uh, in for July 1st. And as Neil would know, there were not very many apartments back in those days. And the entire place was full because all the new medical residents came in. There were no apartments. So I stayed not not in Kathleen's room, but I stayed in Nelson's room. <laughs> <laughs> with my wife uh, for the first week we were there because you guys were off at the beach at your family vacation. Um, so he's very generous that way. Um, but he was very welcoming to all the international students. And he'll pick people up at the airport and things like that, uh, making it very easy for those people to transition to being here. So. Yeah, one thing I will never uh, forget is that, I, I, you know, I, I came from China and had no rel relatives, no parents in this country. And I think Mark actually even hosted in my graduation party, a huge party, you know, including my kid and my my pet, uh, my mother and the, and and my mother still talk about it these days. You know, she never imagined somebody would host, um, you know, almost for her my graduation party. He's just that kind. So, so I think for me, the lesson I got from Mark, and I I, I guess I would probably convey to a younger uh, younger faculty, is be passionate. Passionate. I mentioned that Mark was really passionate about his work, but the science also. Passionate about a field of question. Just try to address or answer a question that passionate you. Uh, you know, I, I think that's the key for success. And, and my feeling, I may be wrong, maybe people can, can jump in, but my feeling is that Mark was so successful because he was interested in some questions and, and he thought they were important and he followed them. 
independently if they were difficult, like uh, Richard mentioned, in terms of the technique were not there, but you wanted to address this. So, so I think that if you're passionate about something and, and you're interested in, in a key question, just follow it. Don't be trendy. And, you know, the problem now in science is that there are all those calls for uh, for new new uh, new areas of research. And you know, it's very hard to predict what's going to be very impactful in the future. But if you consistently do or address questions that are important now and you do a great job at, at it, which Mark, I, I think, did all his career, you will finally thrive and and and, and be successful in, uh, in your research. So this is what... A message, the youngest, and uh, what I got from Mark. Yeah, the same style. You once told me there were no unre- there were much less unreplicated result than we think there are. There's a lot more unreplicated conditions, and so pay attention to every technical details of how someone led, reached some conclusion, got some results. When you try to replicate, don't go gun ho and try to reinvent the wheel. Because then you may find it different. Maybe you're asking a different question, and maybe you'll have a different answer. So that's um, that very clear attention. I mean, you told us at the beginning about the, the pot of uh, digitonin. Uh, with the wrong part of digitonin, you don't get a beta 2 adrenergic receptor purified. So you need, it's, it's this lot at this time because the industry was like that at this time and that's the reagent you can get. So pay attention to that. I think, yeah, for me, yeah, two thoughts for inspiring, I guess, young scientists. Uh, number one, I think is, and it's already been mentioned at some level, but to find the, a good mentor, right? And and I think that, you know, a good mentor like Mark uh, is going to be with you every step of the way and have your back every step of the way. And it's just so important. And I hear stories of all of these people who have had just horrible postdocs. And I look back and I, it's almost hard for me to comprehend because I feel like me, it was the greatest scientific time of my life where I just got to be around a bunch of, you know, you know, phenomenally uh, gifted people and, and have a great mentor and have ideas just coursing through the lab all the time. And I think that's what, you know, Mark, uh, uh, I think, really meant to the field in general is just how, how to mentor and how to mentor well. Uh, but then, you know, um, one of my favorite stories of Mark is the one of the days, the first day I really met him formally when I was interviewing with him. And I was asking him, and I'll never forget what he said. I was asking him about, you know, what work hours look like in the lab. You know, uh, how much should I be thinking about working? And he said in a joking way, but he said it, and it was I just, I'll never forget. He said, well, I'm already famous, so I don't care how much you work. And really what he was getting at and what he was describing to me, and he's, he was saying, you know, own it. This is your job, right? Uh, and he really reiterated that, that you know, my career is going to go as far as I'm willing to work at it. Uh, and how much I work is not going to impact him in the end, right? Because this is ownership of my science, ownership of my my, my career. And I think that getting uh, young scientists to understand that, that this isn't necessarily, you know, the kind of quintessential nine to five job, right? This is uh, uh, something that you have to own and work at. And uh, I think, uh, you know, that stuck with me. And, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, yeah. We'll leave it there. Thank you. Anyone else wants to add anything before we go to closing remarks, Kathleen? Well, I just uh, just to toss one idea out there that that you know hasn't really been mentioned per se. So the the people who are there a long time, so Larry, Eric, of course, uh, Neil, myself, I was there for a long time, twenty twenty six years. It's no fluke, okay. His lab, generation after generation of students and postdocs, was always producing top-notch work. And that came from him being very good at picking his people, but also being very good at motivating the people that he did have. And to get all those different parts who are working on different projects, working together in their own different way toward a larger goal. Um, so it was no fluke. He, he, he had that skill. 
Thank you, Richard. Which, uh, Kathleen, before we move on, you know, you, you made an interesting comment around Mark being able to pick the right people. What do you think was important to Mark when he was picking someone to come and work in his lab? And we can quickly go around. I think it's well, he, he told me it's very similar to Josh um, when I was starting my lab and I was picking people. Of course, I, my first graduate student that didn't work out, and you know that. Had, and so I was worried that I was, you know, on a track for failure because I wasn't picking the right people. And um, and he, very similar to what Josh said. If you're picking someone who's coming to work for you you've picked the wrong person, right? Because it, it, it's got, you've got to pick people who are there to work for themselves and, and who, who have that drive and that passion and who want their own career, right? And, and then you help and mentor and shepherd and, you know, uh, along the way, but it's, it's not a, a sort of, you know, you're the boss, you work for me, I tell you what to do and you nine to five, you know, it's, it, it has to be a partnership and teamwork and, you know, you've got to go all in. Um, and so I, I remember that similar to Josh, he gave me that advice. And and I, I do my interviews that way now. <laughs> I don't know that I quote him exactly, but I tell them, don't work for me because I don't need you to work for me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's a good lesson. One other way to put that is if you want to hire yourself, someone who's got at least your level of motivation. And if you can, someone even more motivated. I'm still trying to figure out why he hired me, quite honest. <laughs> I came with very little skill for my journey at McGill. So obviously he saw something and I saw something in him and, and um, it turned out to be a synergistic relationship. I guess that's what you're hoping for when you, when you pick a student. And I think the, the, the sad part that we don't talk about it, it it's, it's only about 30% of the people that come through Mark's lab have actually figured it out. There is a sizable proportion that they did okay, but they never continued on to be independent, successful on their own. They found new career paths, and Mark was always supportive of it, but not anybody went on to a high pirate industry job or you know, a job in academia. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Okay, well, I think this sounds like a, a good time for a pause and sort of a natural um, closing um, to, to our session. And so I just want to, um, it's hard to wrap up, um, but I've, I've been so touched and moved personally by all of your insights and experiences and sharing of stories. Um, it, it's wonderful for me, um, and I, I hope that it's been enjoyable for you. And I hope that those listening to the podcast have some fun kernels in there um, to, to take with them. And so really, I just wanna thank um, all of you for taking this time and sharing and reflecting and, and you know, passing on your knowledge and your experiences of being in the Crone Lab or working with Mark and, and the team. Um, and again, a, a huge thanks from our family, um, from Melissa and Nelson, and uh, many thanks to Yamina for scheduling and, and working all of this. It's a huge undertaking, and um, we're, we're just so ever grateful for all of the effort and, and show and love of support. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us, not only for episode two, but also the, the group of 30-plus people that responded, yes, were coming and were able to come and join us and share all of these stories and these lessons learned. And I think it's, again, it's, it's, it speaks volumes to the impact that Mark had on so many people. Um, and not only those who were able to, to join us, but everyone else who wasn't able to, to come because I think, I think we could have made a whole year worth of, of podcasts by inviting everyone who, uh, who was, worked with Mark uh, either as a collaborator or, or trained in his lab. But I want to say thank you to Kathleen for, for your help being my wonderful co-host and for also helping me put together this list. Um, and with this, I want to say thank you all for, for joining us. I'm going to stop recording. Please don't go anywhere. But this is episode two of uh, three, actually a four 
uh, episode podcast series honoring Dr. Mark Caron. And with this, thanks everybody. Thank you for joining us and listening to this very special Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We would like to thank our guests, my co-host, Dr. Kathleen Caron, and our Dr. GPCR team members, Attila Forrest, Ines Pinero, and Monsera avila Zozoya. A huge thank you to our ecosystem partners for their support, namely Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. You can connect with our partners directly in the ecosystem. Join us today at drgpcr.com slash ecosystem. You can also su subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Find us on YouTube, and if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. And until next time, stay safe. <laughs>